Ya, aku tak kacau orang ni juga. Ya, ya. I don't know. <laughs> That's what happened with that. Until midnight, reading all the blogs on the uh, Pennsylvania debate, you don't get as much sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we should start. So how's chapter 6 going? <coughs> Is it harder than the previous chapters? Is it easier? About the same? Have I put that again? Any questions about what we talked about last time? Our basic... Any questions about our basic definitions? <laughs> All right, then. So what do we know so far? Um, we know that whatever you can do in f of n time, you can do deterministically in that much space. We also know that whatever you can do deterministically or non-deterministically in f of n time, you can do, sorry, in f of n space, you can do in time, which goes like this, because you can convert it to a reachability problem, Hey, Chris. Yeah? 
We can't. We can't see you. <laughs> oh. Maybe I need to talk to the HR person. Hold on. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, We can see you now. Oh, you can see us now? Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we know that um, anything you can do deterministically or non-deterministically with f of n space, you can view this as a reachability problem on this graph the state space of the computer, the set of all states that the workspace can be in. So you can get a reachability problem on a graph with two to the f of n, two to the order f of n um, uh, states, where you know each vertex in this graph is one of the many possible states that the workspace of the computer can be in. In the case of your computer, one of this incredibly large 2 to the 10 to the 12th, 2 to the trillion possible states that your computer could be in. Um, but, you know, as long as we're thinking about what we can do in a certain amount of time then, we know that we can solve this in polynomial time as a function of the number of vertices, because we know that reachability is in P. Right? Normally, when we say reachability is in P, we mean on graphs of polynomial size. But that's still true even for these astronomically large graphs corresponding to the state space of the computer. And so polynomial in N, if it's like N squared, N cubed, all that does is the two or three goes into the, uh, as they go there. So this is still two to the end of N. Um, and when you combine this with the fact that deterministic time is contained in non-deterministic time, and deterministic space is contained in non-deterministic space, um, you get this nice hierarchy. Right? So, so you can think of it this way. Here's um, log space, non-deterministic log space. Here's P, NP. Here's polynomial space. Here's I'm going to call this NP space right now, even though these will turn out to be equal. Here's exponential time. Here's non-deterministic exponential time. And what we know is that there are inclusions that look like this, kind of going back and forth between space and time, in addition to the ones we already know about within, a certain, within the time hierarchy and within the space hierarchy. We don't, I'm, I write these as subset or equal because we don't know that these things are different. So um, we're in this funny situation where, remember, I, when we were discussing P versus NP, I stated but did not prove the fact that we do know that exponential time is bigger than P. Okay, well, at least we know that. That with exponential time, you can do things that you can't with polynomial time. We also know, I, although I haven't proved this, that we can do more with polynomial memory than we can with logarithmic memory. Okay. So again, when you're comparing apples to apples, we know that giving you more time or more memory makes you more powerful. What we don't know very much about is how these different resources compare to each other. How much more powerful is memory, a certain amount of memory than a certain amount of time, or vice versa, and how much more powerful does adding the n in front give you. So ironically, um, it's entirely possible uh, it's entirely possible that um, P, not only is it possible that P equals NP, it's possible that both of these equal P space, which is an even more monstrous possibility than P equaling NP, but we don't know that this is not true. Um, 
right now, maybe it's not obvious how crazy this would be. But once we get discussing the fact that in P-space you can tell um, whether the current player has a winning strategy in a game, that means you can explore this exponentially branching tree of possible lines of play in the game, then I think you'll agree it's even more unreasonable to believe that we can do all that in polynomial time than it is that we can solve satisfiability or things like that. Um, all right. So, uh, so this this picture that reachability is a generic. It's kind of a generic way to talk about any problem that you can solve in a certain amount of memory. Um, is a very nice picture. It lets us prove lots of things. So, in some sense, what I'm saying is that um, if f of n is log that 2 to the f of n is poly, then that gives us this fact that reachability is in n log space. So right, reachability for, um, for polynomial sized graphs, the kind of graph that I can actually hand the whole thing to in the input. Um, so it's complete for log space. That's what we showed last time. But somehow this scaled up version of reachability on these really big graphs that's complete for other amounts of memory. Um, all right. So what I want to do now, what I want to do today, is prove Savage's theorem. And as I said at the end of last time, Savage's theorem shows us that where memory is concerned, moving from deterministic to non-deterministic computation seems somehow to make a bit less difference than in time. So as far as we know, if you have a non-deterministic problem, you can solve a problem non-deterministically with a certain amount of time. If you want to do it deterministically, as far as we know, you need exponentially more time. Okay. As far as we know, because what is this class, right? This is the class of problems where if the answer is yes, there's a witness that you can check in order f of n time. Okay. Um, well, as far as we know, you need to do roughly an exhaustive search over all possible witnesses. And there are this many possible witnesses. So we think that where time is concerned, um, actually finding things is exponentially harder than checking them. Takes exponentially more time. So Savage's theorem says that where space is concerned, somehow the jump is not as big. It just squares the amount of space. Um, and in particular, this means that what you can do non-deterministically in polynomial space equals what you can do deterministically in polynomial space. You just might need a bigger polynomial. All right, so how are we going to prove this? So the way we're going to prove this is by proving, so, well, I just erased, but I'm going to write it again at the top here. So n space of f, again, it's like reachability on a graph of size 2 to the order f. <clears throat> so I'm going to show that I can solve this kind of problem in order f squared space. So another way to put this is that if I actually hand you the whole graph so that the input has size n, reachability is in space <coughs> log squared n for a graph of size n. With me? So, um, 
Right. So what am I saying? I'm saying that if I give you read-only access to a graph with n vertices, we only saw that with a little workspace of size log n, I can solve this problem non-deterministically, which means a prover <coughs> takes me by the hand and shows me the way through the graph. And all I need to remember is my current location, which is just a number between 1 and n, which only takes log n bits to encode. So it's a little surprising, but if you change this log to log n squared, we can find the path without any help from a prover. Okay. So the idea is that I'm going to look at an algorithm for reachability, and the fact that I can, the fact that there's an algorithm for the, for reachability which only needs this much space, implies Savage's theorem. Okay. Because these big ver these big reachability problems that come from more space. Well, the point is that if n equals 2 to the order f, then log squared n is order f squared. So this reachability algorithm is going to be a little bit similar but a little bit different to the algorithms that we talked about near the beginning of the semester. At the beginning of the semester, we were just trying to prove that reachability is in P which you already kind of knew from your algorithms courses because of things like Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest path. Um, but we were focused on time. We were trying to save time. So here, our concerns are different. We're going to save memory. And in fact, the algorithm we're going to come up with is going to take a little bit more than polynomial time. It will be a rather wasteful algorithm as far as time is concerned. Um, It'll be, I think, quasi-polynomial, but not polynomial. In fact, the running time will end up being 2 to the log squared, which is the biggest it could be with, a, with this much workspace okay. without falling into an endless loop. And that's n to the log n, which is a wee bit bigger than a polynomial. Okay. So this will be a time-wasting algorithm, but a very memory-efficient algorithm. That's the idea. <laughs> All right, so let's just focus on this. If you understand how we're going to scale it up to these huge graphs and use that to prove Savage's theorem. All right, so <clears throat> we're again going to use this idea of middle first search. So what I'm going to do is, so, so remember kind of the logic behind middle first search. <coughs> um, I'm going to define R, I, J, L as this Boolean thing, um, which is one or zero, true or false, depending on if there is a path from i to j of length l or less. Okay? And the initial question, the initial reachability question, will be stn, or I guess you could make it n minus 1, who cares? Okay? Can I get from s to t? If I can get there at all, I can get there in n steps. All right. Now, um, the idea of middle first search is this, that R of I, J, and L can be written as, again, I'm going to use this symbol to mean an or of a bunch of things, just like we would use capital sigma to mean the sum of a bunch of things. Sum, the, the or over all possible midpoints of this path. And for each one, the question is, can I get from i to k in length l over 2? And can I get from k to j in length l over 2? 
Now, in case you're wondering, yes, if L is odd, one of these needs to be rounded up and the other needs to be rounded down, and I will ignore all that, okay. as, we, as we should. So, um, okay. <clears throat> so, um, now, at the beginning of the semester, we remember we changed this into this matrix squaring algorithm, but it was also in a way a dynamic programming algorithm. And the idea was that if you know all the pairs of things that you can get to from one to the other with paths of length up to L over two, you can use this to learn all the things, all the pairs you can get to with paths of length L. And you keep scaling that up until you have paths of length N, and now you've solved the all pairs reachability problem. And we can do the weighted version for shorter paths if we care. But this is all unweighted. <clears throat> so in that case, I remembered all these previous values. That's what dynamic programming does, right? It keeps track of all the things you've calculated before. <clears throat> well, that saves a lot of time, but it eats up memory, okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to recalculate everything under the sun, mm -hmm. which is going to give us an algorithm which is very wasteful in terms of time, but very efficient in terms of memory. That's, that's the whole idea. Okay. So at this point, I think you could probably complete the argument. The point is that I'm going to treat this as a recursive algorithm in which I don't memorize my previous values. And because we wanted to write this book for a broad audience, in that part of the chapter, we teach them something that you already know, which is that uh, to run a recursive algorithm, you need to keep track of the stack. So the idea is that, you know, down here, uh, way down here, I'm calculating, I'm still calculating the original thing I wanted to calculate. But up here, as I've pushed these daughter functions onto the stack, you know, maybe I'm still asking, can I get from vertex one to vertex four with something of uh, length at most eight. So I'm currently calculating this question. And how does this work? Well, I do a loop over all possible midpoints. So let's say I'm currently checking, well, maybe I can do that by passing through vertex seven. But if this whole thing was of length eight, then maybe each, each half of the path would be of length four. So maybe at the moment I'm checking to see if I can get from one to seven <coughs> in four steps or less. And maybe in the course of doing that, I've already learned that I can get from one to vertex nine in two steps. So I already know I can do this. So now I'm checking the second half of this little path. Um, sorry. 9, comma, 7, comma, 2. I'm currently checking the second half of this first half of this, which in turn is the first or second half of something else, and so on. Okay. And this keeps, so I mean, first of all, are you all comfortable with the idea that if I just use this as a recursive algorithm, I mean, shall we write pseudocode? We can write pseudocode if you like. It's just a loop over k, a for loop. Okay. As soon as we find something where this works and this works, we return yes. Um, right. So, um, so first of all, what's the base case? Well, this. Let's say here I'm asking, can I get from nine to seven in two steps by going through eleven? Well, the nice thing, first of all, is that when I get all the way down to distance one, how do I answer that question? To the matrix. So yeah. Exactly. Now I go and look at the graph. Exactly. Okay. So it's only when I get down to that case of asking, can I get from here to here in one step? Well, that's just an edge. So now I go and look at the graph and check to see if that graph, that edge exists. I should say that I mean one or less. So the other way I could get from here to here in one step or less is if these are the same. So I also, they're the same. I answer yes. Okay. So that's the base case. So. Um, and then I just 
do this recursive thing. So let's not worry about the running time. We'll look at that in a moment, if we care. Um, but I'm, so the total memory, I mean, I need to hold all this in my workspace. I need to hold in my workspace this whole record of which question I'm answering, why I was asking that, it was a half of this, I was asking that because it was half of this, and so on. And you know, this is my record of where I am in this big recursive calculation. Um, and I don't remember anything else. So every time I find myself asking, gee, can I get from one vertex one to vertex seven in four steps or less? I might keep in mind, I might ask that question many, many different times, right? Mm -hmm. As part potentially of all sorts of different paths. And I recalculate it every time. The question is just what's the total size of the stack? Well, what's the depth of the stack? Log okay. The depth is log n because L is initially n and it gets divided by 2 at each level of the recursion. And how many bits do I need to hold each part of the stack? Log n. Mm -hmm. Log n because each part of the stack just has three numbers. The two vertices you're trying to, you're exploring at the moment and the length. <coughs> Of the part of, of the path that you're hoping to find between those two vertices, those are three numbers, each of which ranges from one to n. Those are three log n bit strings. So it's order log n. So log n times log n, order log n squared. So maybe I'll leave the running time as an exercise. Um, <coughs> But indeed, it's not polynomial because of all this recalculation. But we don't care. As far as memory goes, it's very efficient. So reachability is in space, is in log squared space, which as you can imagine, sort of L, here's L, here's NL, and then here's, some people call this L squared. I, I'm not sure I like that notation, but anyway. So space log squared, um, we've just proved this because reachability is NL complete. So since we can solve reachability in log squared space, anything in NL is in log squared space. And the point is, well, the same argument works for larger amounts. It's just that now, instead of going and looking at a graph of the state space, so now imagining that I, I have a program running with f of n memory. And now I'm doing the same thing. And now I'm asking, can I get the computer from this state to this state in one step of computation? Well, I don't have this huge graph written out, but that's OK. I can still answer that question. Now what I look at in my read-only memory is the program. Right? And I put it in, the, in that initial state, and what do I do? I just simulate one step of the program and see if it takes place to the other state. Okay, so again, so, so, so the idea here is that the state space of a computer is a really massive graph. But it's not just an arbitrary massive graph. It's a massive graph with a very short and sweet description namely the source code of your program. Okay. Even though I have two to the trillion states your laptop could be in, all I need to do to see whether there's an edge from this state to that state is look at whatever program you're running. Okay. So it's a graph of size two to the trillion, but with a very short and compact description. I don't need to give you the entire map, and you wouldn't want me to. But all we need to do is answer single questions of the form, can I get from here to here in one step? And we can do that by simulating a program. OK, I've said that 18 times now. But I, I have the impression this is sort of a tricky point. Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm delivering it. Um, all right. Well, that's Savage's theorem. And again, obviously it has to do with the fact that memory can be reused uh, and so by recalculating things, yes, we waste time, but we save lots of memory. We can use the same memory over and over again because, of course, you know, we pop things off the stack, then we use the same memory to put things in. 
All right. So we proved Savage's theorem. Isn't, isn't that just a case for when f n is log n? Sorry. What? I mean, no. I mean, we, we, didn't we just prove, prove that for log n case of Savage's theorem? Yeah, but now I'm saying you can scale this up to the case of any amount of memory. You're still solving a reachability problem. Mm -hmm. You're solving it on this massive graph, the state space of the entire computer. But you're going to use the same idea. Okay. And the good news is you don't need to have the graph in your memory. You just need to be able to answer these questions one at a time. Is there an edge or not? And you can do that by simulating the program. And you can simulate the program in the same amount of space. See. So, I mean, right, what happens then is that a what you need to have here is your current state, I, but this is, what, how do I tell you what the current state of your workspace is? I just tell you the value of all of the bits, but that takes f of n bits because you have f of n workspace. And it will be. And the same for this other state. And what's the length? Well, the length of a path here is at most capital N, the number of states, but that's 2 to the f of n. Okay. So the length of this path, again, only takes the f of n bits to give you. So that depth will be fn too. Yeah, so this is all order fn. Yes, and then the depth. So the depth is log of capital N, where n is the number of states, but that's order f, because n is 2 to the f. So f depth, f bits per level, f squared. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, well, let's move on to the next curious thing about memory, which is the Immermann Zalapchenyi theorem. theorem. Uh, I think that's where the action is. Can't remember. Um, so this is another surprising theorem. So you remember that we think that co NP and NP, we believe these are different, right? We think that if there isn't a Hamiltonian path, there's no simple witness that you can check that shows there isn't a Hamiltonian path. Well, here's something surprising. And more generally, so let's figure out what in the world this is saying. So one way to put this is that reachability is in co-NL. Since reachability is NL complete, if reachability is in co-NL, this means that all of NL is in co-NL. But by symmetry, all of co-NL then is in NL, and they're the same. Okay. So another way to put this is that non-reachability is in NL. So, okay, so what's going on? A problem is in NL, if a witness can, if a prover can give us a witness that we read from left to right, that kind of leads us through the state space until we get to a final state where we say yes. Well, that's a reachability problem. This is saying that non-reachability problems are also reachability problems. Okay? So it's saying that in it's saying that. I can prove to you that I can't get from S to T by showing you in some other graph that I can get from somewhere to somewhere else. That sounds rather weird. So, I mean, to put it differently, going back to P and NP, going back to NP and CoNP, we think that the, that the property of having a Hamiltonian path has a very different logical flavor 
than the property of not having one. Because there exists is very different from for all things that they don't work as Hamiltonian paths. And for exists and for alls are different, very different kinds of logical quantifiers. Well, it turns out that there being a path and there not being a path have the same logical flavor. And this is quite surprising. So um, we're going to prove it this way. <clears throat> All right. I, I had to read this like three or four times in Sipser before I understood it. So then I was like, OK, I, I'm going to write a really nice uh, I, I'm going to write this so that people understand the first time through. <laughs> but of course, it's hard for me to put my mind back in that frame of mind I was in before when I didn't understand. Although I could just wait a couple of years and then I would forget and then I could look. But um, so again, I really want to know whether the book is clear on this point because this is rather tricky. So here's here's the idea. Um, it goes under the name of inductive counting, which is just a name. So um, basically, here's the idea. I'm going to prove to you. Um, here, can I borrow your book so I use the same notation? I don't want to add notational confusion on top of uh, genuine cognitive difficulty. Um, OK, yes. All right. You know, anything looks good when you typeset it like this. I mean, just to the eye, it looks really great. So you know, when Donald Knuth invented tech, he sort of gave every loon in the world the ability to create something which looks like good science, <laughs> you know, which has both good and bad consequences. Um, yeah. But it, it really adds to your confidence as a student when you can produce these things that look just like you know they were written by 60-year-old professionals. Um, OK. So here's how it's going to work. Um, so I'll be the prover. You be the verifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you be the verifier. <laughs> Um, now, I will prove to you, here's the idea, <clears throat> that there are R sub L vertices which are reachable from S. Okay? So I will somehow, through some witness, which we will describe, I will convince you of the precise number of vertices that are reachable from S. OK? Then I will go through all N vertices for R sub L of them. I will show you a path. But none of these will be T. Okay, so I'm trying to prove to you that there's no path from S to T. My strategy for proving that will be to first convince you of exactly how many vertices can be reached from S to T. But it can be reached from S, sorry. Then I'll go through all the vertices in order. And I'll show you, OK, here's how to get from S to vertex 3. And I'll show you a path. And I'll say, OK, vertex 3. And then I'll show you, here's how to get from S to vertex 4 with a path. Now, you don't have enough memory to remember the list of vertices I've shown you, because that would take n bits. <laughs> But you do remember that I've shown you a certain number of them so far. And 
that none of the ones I showed you were T. And you keep a counter. Certainly in order log n <coughs> space, you can have any finite number of counters. OK, any constant number of counters. So you know R sub L. I've proved that to you. We'll, we'll get to how. And then you keep a counter of how many I've shown you that can be reached. And when that reaches R sub L, I say, there, you see? And T wasn't one of them. So by the process of elimination, you cannot get from S to T. That's the idea. How can we keep track of which has been checked? I'm, because I'm going to go through them in order. Oh, by the index. So you'll also know the index of the last one I showed you. Okay. And that way, right, because I, keep in mind you have very little memory, it would be easy to trick you and say, this is how to get to vertex 3. And you say, oh, yes, I see. This is how to get to vertex 17. You say, yes. I say, oh, and did I mention vertex 3? You can get from here to vertex 3. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's another one. <laughs> so what we'll do is you'll keep track of the counter I showed you so that I can't cheat by going back and showing you the same one multiple times. OK. All right. How could you claim that the counter will not be uh, n, the number of vertices? Say again. Say if, if t is like a lone vertex, and here you have a click. So you have to keep track of every, right? The counter size will be almost the same size as the, the graph. Yeah, but you can, the counter size, the, the value of the counter will go up to n, but the size in bits of is only log n. OK. Right? Because it's in binary. <clears throat> All right. So how am I going to show you what R sub L is? Well, by induction, OK? So what's R sub 0? Well, that's just 1. The only place you can get to from S is S in 0 steps. So we start there, OK? <coughs> so suppose you know, and I have proved to you, and you've checked the proof, R sub <laughs> L minus 1. Well, let's say R sub L. Okay? So I'm now, I'm now going to give you a proof of the value of R sub L plus 1. Okay? Um, so here's how I do it. So the idea is I, I've shown you that there are R sub L different vertices you can get to in paths of less than L. Right. Now keep in mind, you can't remember which vertices these are. You don't have enough memory. The only thing you know at this point is this number, R sub L, because that's only log n bits. <coughs> OK. So um, I go through all the vertices, um, u, in order from 1 to n. And you keep me honest and make sure I am doing it in order by keeping track of the last index, the last u I showed you, and making sure that the next u I showed you is bigger. Okay. Um, for each u, I either prove that you can get from s to u in less than or equal to L plus 1 steps. Or I prove that you can't, that you cannot do this in L plus 1 steps. All right? So the idea is that each time, and, and we'll talk about how, but so every time I show you one that you can reach, you increment a counter. Every time I show you every every time I show you one that you can't, you don't. And then at the end, the value of the counter is R sub L plus one. Okay. Good. So how do I if I can get from S to you in L plus one or fewer steps, how do I prove it to you? I show you the path. And you check the path, no problem. And you can keep a counter along the path to make sure that its length 
is less than or equal to L plus one, because that counter and L are just two more log n bit numbers. Okay? Um, good. So this is the tricky part. Now I'm I want to prove to you that I can't get from S to U in L plus one steps. But for that, I'll use this roughly the same idea I had here. Okay? So I do this by, I, I say to you, we can think of it a little bit like a conversation, even though you're really just reading, you're reading a long letter to me. Uh, you're reading a long letter from me, right? From left to right, or from top to bottom. So I tell you, okay, friend, I will tell you, I will now prove that you can't get from S to U in L plus one or fewer steps. And uh, so remember that you can get to R sub L places in L or fewer steps. You remember that? You say, oh, yes, I remember that. Of course, you don't remember which ones. So I'm going to show you all of them. OK? Mm -hmm. So I show you in order, again, with you making sure I'm doing it in order, all R sub L vertices you can reach from S in less than or equal to L steps. For each one, I prove that to you by showing you a path, which you check. And then, if these vertices are called V, for each one, you can check. There is no V. Right. That V is not U. And um, there's no edge directly from V to U. OK? So I remind you again of all the places you can get to in L steps. I prove each one to you with a path. And I point out, well, but none of these get you to U with one more step. So you can't get to U. I'm going to do this over and over again, right? Yeah, because I, because I, I proved to you that you can't get to vertex 40, 48 in L plus 1 steps by going again through all the places you can get to in L steps. OK, then you say, all right, good, you've convinced me. Now I say, ah, oh, well, you can't get to vertex 49 either. Well, why is that? Well, I do this again. <laughs> OK, so the witness is long. The witness is, is roughly like the running time, right? because that's how long it takes you to read through all this and check it. So it's long. Um, it's a bit more than polynomial. Well, no, I guess it's polynomially long. Yeah, it's polynomially long. But it's like, I don't know, n to the fourth or something. I actually I have a note about this somewhere. Okay, Because I redo so many things so many times. How do you make sure that you have covered all that possible? Well. L. Uh, well, how, how could I cheat? I guess. Um, like so every time, every time I prove that some, I, I claim that something can be reached. That's easy. I just have to show you the path. Yeah. And every time I claim that something can't be reached, I rely on the fact that you already know how many places can be reached in one fewer step. Oh, I see. So I show you all of them with a path for each one. And for each one of those, so and you make, you know, you keep a counter how many I've shown you to make sure that I do show you are all R sub L of them, right? What if you give some, I mean, repeat, like? Well, you also you keep track, you make sure that I'm showing them to you in increasing order, so I can't show you the same one twice, and you keep a counter of how many I've shown you so far. Increasing order. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the vertices are labeled just by integers, one to oh, n, right? right? So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we do this inductively. We do this n times until l equals n, and finally we use this argument by elimination, which is just really like this one, to show you. And here are all the places you can get to. Here's a path for each one, and none of them were t. And finally, we're done. <clears throat> All right. 
I, I will not be offended if, well, try to hold on to this for 72 hours or so. I, I will not be offended if you're unable to reproduce this from scratch on a desert island. <laughs> um, it's quite clever. It's one of these, you know, it's very clever, and two people came up with it independently within a few months of each other. You know how these things are. Yes? So this just showed that the non-reachability is in and out. It does not show for all problems, right? Uh, unless yes, this one is in L L complete or something. So if non-reachability is in NL, that's this, exactly the same as saying that reachability is in co-NL. Right. right? Um, but reachability is NL complete. So this means that NL is contained in co-NL. But by symmetry, co-NL is contained in NL, so they're equal. I mean, I could have phrased the whole thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, another way to put it is, well, non-reachability is already known to be co-NL complete, just as reachability is NL complete. Right? Remember, unsatisfiability is co-NP complete by definition. But so I mean to prove so I claim that we've shown that so this means that NL equals co NL. To scale this up, you again do the same thing, except now the graph in question is the state space of some big uh, of some program. And again, to answer this question, is there an edge from here to here? You simulate one step of the program. All right. I mean, I, I think it's, um, you know, uh, so if you're, if you're, if you really, right, I mean, let's see. There are mathematicians who are happy to prove things, and there are others who really want to know, but what does it mean? And I have to say, this is one of these funny results where I can see the proof, but I'm still not sure I really have a feel for it. I mean, um, so a as a cartoon, right, suppose that I have what's called a grid graph. So a grid graph is just some subset of the edges of a grid, OK? Well, this is really just a cartoon. In this case, if there isn't a path from here to here, that's because if I draw this thing, this dual graph, then there is a path from here to there. Right? And because it's all planar, because there's a path from here to here, there's no path from there to there. But that's not what's going on. Right? That's a much simpler situation in which I can change a non reachability problem to a reachability problem. So, another way to put this is that if I give you a graph G and two vertices S and T, there is a reduction I can do. It's even a log space reduction, which changes this to a new graph with a new pair of vertices, such that you can get from S to T in this graph, if and only if you can't get from S prime to T prime in this graph G prime. In this inverse of ages? No, that doesn't work. <laughs> because I mean, right? I can get from here to here in this graph, uh, but if I take its complement, oh, yes. there oh, oh well, may, okay, not in this case. Sorry. Yeah, there's a direct link. Between yeah, there will be just direct. Okay, <laughs> and in the complement, there's also a, oh, in the complement, there's a direct link. Duh. Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So it's not something that simple. I mean, so I mean, where would we get this graph? Well, this algorithm only has, I forget how many we got up to, six or seven counters, each of which takes log n bits. So its total size is 2 to the 7 log n, which is like n to the 7th. So it has a state space of size n to the 7th, or 6 or 4, I don't know. So it's polynomially bigger. Um, so this also means. Um, Remember, we talked a little bit about this. Did we talk about the polynomial hierarchy? OK, well, we'll talk about that more when we get into games. I mean, 
I think I just mentioned that if NP is like P with a single there exists in front of it, then there's a higher class with this and a, st a yet higher class with this. And we believe that each of these things is higher, right? Okay. So, but where L is concerned, well, this is already NL, but if I do this, this can collapse back down because co-NL is like L with a for all in front of it, and then I can combine these two for alls. So with polynomial time, we think that as I add more quantifiers, I'm getting a more and more complicated kind of nested search. But with log space, it eats the quantifiers. So all these things end up being the same. Um, yeah, but I see the algorithm. I know, I understand the result. I guess I'm just not quite sure I understand why, why it works at that deeper level. All right. Um, and, you know, again, this is part of why this field is charming. I mean, for a long time, people thought, well, come on, NL and CoNL have to be different, just like NP and CoNP have to be different. And then, you know, these things are floating around for, I'm not sure, 10 years or something. And then somebody comes up with this rather simple argument and proves something that we found totally unbelievable before. All right. Um, so, well, good, we still have a little bit of time. This is great. I thought this would take much longer. So now I want to start gearing up to talk about games. And I want to talk about reachability as a game. Any questions about this before I leave it behind? So please, please read this section of the book and honestly tell me whether, even if you hadn't seen the lecture, and you were stuck on a desert island with my book, and you hadn't decided to use it for firewood, <laughs> if, if, it, if you would have understood. Because I, I, I found this tricky. Um, if you read it in Sipser, he doesn't talk about a witness with a prover handing it to you. He talks about a non-deterministic algorithm. So he has a for loop where it says, either do this or skip it. And that, in my case, is like the prover choosing to prove to you that a certain vertex is reachable or not. I find the witness version a lot easier to understand, but you may or may not. I don't know. All right, so feedback, please. All right, so, um, so reachability, where, where memory is, sorry, was there a question? Where, reach, where memory is concerned, reachability is this, it's really this gift that keeps on giving. I mean, you know, by looking at this funky middle first algorithm for it, we proved Savage's theorem. By looking at this funny witness for non-reachability, we proved that NL and CoNL are the same. Um, uh, well, let's, let's keep it up. So, Let's again write that we can get from one vertex, well, let's write it this way. We can get from S to T in N steps. Um, let me write it in logical form. If there exists a midpoint K such that um, you can get from S to K in N over two steps, and from K to T in N over two steps. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, let's write this in another way. An and is a for all, right? If I say something is true for all things, I mean it's true for this and for that and for that. So let's say this, there exists a K if for all, in which in this case is just both, <coughs> for both halves, okay? So I'm going to be interested in a pair of vertices, which is either the pair SK or the pair KT. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, I'm, I'm writing, I know this is a little convoluted, but there's a very good reason I'm writing it this way, I promise. So I claim we can get from S to T. You say, no, no, not true. We will decide this as civilized people do by sitting down and playing a game. <laughs> so since the claim that we can get from S to T starts with a there exists, well, I go first. Okay. Because basically when I claim that we can get from S to T in N steps, that's the same as claiming there is some midpoint K such that we can get from S to K and then from K to T. Okay. So you say, show it to me. I say, here's K. That's my move. I put K on the table. Now it's your turn. The next part of the claim is a for all. Okay. You're trying to disprove this claim. If I say something is true for x equals 1 and is true for x equals 2 and is true for x equals 3, you can disprove that claim by showing me a counterexample. Okay. In this case, you're going to choose one of the two halves. Okay. So here's how the game works. I claim we can get from here to here. You say, prove it. I say, I claim we can do it through here. <coughs> you say, mm, show me how this half of the path is going to work. I said, hmm. well, we can do that by going through here. And you say, I don't believe it. Show me how this quarter of the path is going to work. I claim I can do it through here. <laughs> yes. And finally, you claim, yes, but how does this work? And I say, that's just one edge. Look at the graph. <laughs> you say, ah, you win. <laughs> okay? So I won that one game. Well, maybe there actually was no path here. It's just that you played badly. <laughs> but if I have a winning strategy in this game, if, I will always, if there's a way for me to win, oh, no matter what you do, then there's a path. Okay, isn't that cool? So it's a game. Now, um, I want to say something that I, I probably should have said first. I mean, when, I, when, I, when we first start saying, I can get from S to T, what is the logical structure of that claim? You wouldn't start out with this, right? This is this clever recursive middle first idea. You would start out with saying, well, you're claiming there exists a path, period. There's just one quantifier. Okay? So it's true. I am claiming that there is a whole chain of things, x, x1, x0, which equals s, and x1, and blah, 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 up to xn, which equals t, such that there is a path from x to x1. And there's an edge, I'm sorry, a direct edge from x0 to x1, and from x1 to x2, and so on. Okay. But the problem is, if this is in an exponentially huge graph, this path could be exponentially long. Right? So remember, things with a single there exists are like, like an NP with a prover and a verifier. I claim there's a Hamiltonian path. Show it to me. Here it is. OK, yeah, you're right. I claim there's a path from S to T. Prove it to me. Here it is. Blah, 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 blah. And then you go over here and blah, 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 blah. But it's exponentially long. So I don't even have time to say it to you. You don't have time to check it. OK. So in an exponentially large graph, the claim that I can get from here to there does not seem like an NP claim. It seems too big. Because to be an NP, the witness, the proof, has to be something of polynomial size that you can check in polynomial time. So if the witness is the path, it's too big. It's exponentially large. OK? And since polynomial space is like reachability 
where the number of vertices is exponentially large because it's two to the polynomial, this is exactly why we don't believe that NP equals P space. We think P space is bigger. Because we think the claim that the answer is yes, that there is a path through an exponentially large state space is not a claim that we can prove in polynomial time. So, but this clever recursive scheme here crunches down the size of the claim from something exponential polynomial. to something polynomial but there's a, there's a trade-off, right? So now, the, how many, if, if the total length here was n, which is two to the, let's say it's two to the n, how many moves did we make in our game? What was the length of our game? Two to the n, that would be polynomial. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, if this is two to the poly, the length of our game, since we keep zeroing in on midpoints and dividing the length in two at each point, the number of moves in our game was only polynomial. Okay. The difference is that the question of reachability, it's no longer does there exist a witness that you can check, which is a sort of one round of interaction between us. I send you the witness, you check it, you say, okay. Here, there's this interplay, right? I make a move, you make a move, I make a move, you make a move. And the question of is there a strategy, a strategy is a really big object, right? A strategy is an exponentially large object. Because a strategy is something that tells me what to play in all the exponentially many situations we could end up in which in this case means all the exponentially many pieces of the path that we could zero in on, okay? So what I'm trying to say in a very roundabout way is that if NP is polynomial size witnesses that can be checked, P space is Polynomial, a polynomial number of moves, well, games that last for a polynomial number of moves. So here the answer is yes, if there is a valid witness. Here the answer is yes, if there is a winning strategy. So let's think about some games that only last for a polynomial number of moves. Well, maybe you've played Othello, originally marketed as Reversi. Uh, eight by eight board, we start with, um, uh, you have black stones, I have white stones. Each move lays another stone down and you know, if I put one, uh, if you put one here, then you flip this one to your color. And I put one here and flip this back to white and we keep doing that. So if the board, um, so on an eight by eight board, how many moves are there at most? 64, because we never remove anything. The game is over when the board is full. And then we add up to see who has more stones of their color and that's the winner. So um, now, of course, the eight by eight version is just some finite problem. Playing, you can play it perfectly with order one memory. You just need a really, really big lookup table because there's only a finite number of possible situations, although it's very large. So instead, we, to make it interesting, we have to generalize this to the n by n board. Now the length of the game is at most n squared. So, can you, 
if I give you a position when it's currently Black's turn, can you answer with a polynomial amount of memory whether Black has a winning strategy? Forget all this stuff about reachability. Just how would you write a program which would search the game tree? Have any of you ever done this with board games? All right, well, the point is, let's suppose here is our current position. Okay? It's Black's turn. The question is, does Black have a winning strategy? Well, that means, does Black have a winning move at the moment? So that means, if Black has four possible moves, do any of these lead to a position from which black has a winning strategy, right? So it's a recursive definition. The current position is a winning position for you. Let's call it that if you have a winning strategy. If there is a move you can make, if it's your move, that means that there is a move you can make so that the resulting position is winning for you and losing for your opponent. If it's your opponent's move, the current position is winning for you if what? For, for, for your opponent. For no winning strategy for your opponent. There's no winning move for your opponent, which means, say it with a quantifier. If for any of his moves, he will know. Yeah. Exactly. So if it's your move, it's winning if there exists a move of yours that goes to a winning position. Mm -hmm. Then, when it's your opponent's move, it's a win for you if for all possible moves that he or she could make, the resulting position is still winning for you. Okay. But then it's your move. So you get this alternation of for all and there exists until you get down to some end game position where you can just tell who won. Okay? So games are these alternations between there exists and for all. This is the logical structure of the claim I have a winning strategy. So you mean that um, who goes first has a um, uh, very uh, good winning um, strategy? Uh, I mean, uh, who goes first? Uh, well, in a lot of games, going first is an advantage, but not always. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. But well, I mean, there are some situations where, I mean, for instance, in chess, there are rare situations where you would rather it were not your move. Because you have a nice, um, things are nicely set up and anything you do screws it up. Um, you know, you're, you're forced to move some piece that is no longer protected or something like that. These are rare. Uh, they're called Zugzwang positions. I'm not going to write that down. Um, it's certainly true that in most games, it feels as if you're happy that it's your move. I mean, in the game of Go, for instance, I think you're, you would almost, if I offered you an extra move, you would almost always take it. Okay. Um, and there are a couple of games in which you can... Checkers. Checkers, you would rather it would not your move, I think, a lot of the time. Because you have to move into a place where you're vulnerable, right? There are some games where you can prove that it's your advantage to, to play first. So we'll talk about one of those next time, um, called Hex. Uh, but you know, in chess, we don't we don't know. We believe that white, traditionally in chess, white goes first. Traditionally in Go, it's black. We believe that white has a winning strategy in chess, but no one can prove this. We don't know. Um, so. But, but it seems like in this notation, like. Uh, well, it it's, it's, it's your move, so you're in control. Yes, you're you're in. That's true. Yes, but I mean. In this That's notation, the intuition, but I mean, in this notation, it seems like it's harder to prevent your opponent to do anything. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, I agree. Unless this is a great position and all of these are terrible, uh -huh. then you're upset, even though it's your move. <laughs> so in, in, in some, ga in oh, some games, this for every does not exist. I mean, not for every, but for the majority of the moves that the opponent will play, I can still have this when it's such. Like, for example, in, in chess, you can have a plan to win. 
if your opponent plays the following moves. But if he did not, I have to change my plan. <coughs> I agree. So, uh, but if you have, if you really have a winning strategy, that means you can win no well, matter what your opponent does. Right. I mean, absolute uh, winning strategy. Well, I mean, otherwise, it's not called winning strategy. Yeah, I mean, we're assuming here that both players are kind of infinitely intelligent, right? It seems so, like each player has his own okay. that exists for everyone. Well, yeah. I mean, you, the, your opponent has the same thing, but he's trying to prove the opposite. Exactly. And remember, a a not there exists is the same as for all not blah blah blah, right? So for him, all these things are flipped. It seems like if if not moving is a valid move. Oh well, that's true. If if you're allowed to pass, yeah. If you're allowed to pass, then. Um, then your opponent allows to pass too. Well, yeah, then the only danger is there could be a draw. Right? <laughs> I see. But yes, if, if you're allowed to pass, I guess it's never a disadvantage for it to be your move. Yeah. Um, OK, so I, I want you to think about two things between now and Tuesday. One is write a recursive algorithm, write a little recursive pseudocode, which searches the tree of games and checks to see if the current player has a winning strategy or not. Or if you've ever taken an AI class, you've probably done this. And I mean, there are lots of ways to make the search clever, like alpha, beta, pruning, and blah, blah, blah. But don't worry about that. Feel free to recalculate things. Keep it simple. You mean for this specific game? No, 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 for any game. I mean, pseudocode. You know. Oh, pseudo I see. And, and, and basically, the point is that the depth of the stack is the length of the game, okay? right? Because as you go down all these possible things, you're keeping a stack of you know, what the current position is, what the one previous to it was, what the one previous to it was. And so if the game can only last for a polynomial number of moves, the stack will only be polynomially deep. And if each individual position doesn't take that much memory to encode, Certainly, this is just a little array. The total memory will be polynomial. So the lesson is that for any game where you have a polynomial upper bound on how long it will last, telling whether the current player is a winning strategy is in p-space. Um, the other thing I want to, do, want to show you, and I want you to think about this, is the game of hex. How many of you already know about the game of hex? Oh, what is this world coming to? <laughs> okay, so the game of hex was apparently independently invented by John Nash and the Danish architect Piet Hein. And um, here's the idea. I am black. I have black stones. I want to build a black path from here to here. You are white. You want to build a path of white stones from here to here. So you go there, and I go here. And uh, you say, great, I'll go there. And I get start to get nervous. I go here, and you go here. And now I'm stuck, because if I go here, you go there, and vice versa. And you won. Okay. 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 Prove that there are no draws in this game. Then prove that the first player has a winning strategy. I mean, the intuition here is that in this game, it's always to your advantage if it's your move. Because you can lay down an extra stone, right? You, you never wish it was your other play, the other guy's move. You never want to pass, because an extra stone can only help make paths of your color and can only hurt your opponent for making paths of her color, but prove it. But here's a hint. No one knows what the winning strategy is. So prove, the win prove that a winning strategy exists without finding it. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And play a couple games with some friends on a napkin. It doesn't really get interesting until it's about seven by seven or so. 
Uh, oh, and don't have the first player go in the center. That's too big an advantage. All right. Have a good weekend. Um, I plan to post solutions to the homework tomorrow morning. I know there's one or two stragglers. Um, that's what I'll post. Thank you.